Uh, welcome everybody uh, to this um, online webinar organized uh, by Nature Physics and uh, the Alan Turing Institute. And we have uh, two uh, experts with us, uh, Michele Ceriotti from EPFL Switzerland and Una Kim uh, from Cornell. They are both uh, eminent researchers and experts in machine learning and materials uh, sciences. So uh, we're going to have uh, two 20 minute talks from each of them and then have uh, questions uh, from the audience and the discussion uh, to round out the last 20 minutes uh, of the hour. So uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, Michele, do you want to go first? And then uh, I'll go second. Sure. So I'm assuming that you can see my screen. Yeah. And uh, so thank you, Gabo, for an introduction and thanks uh, everybody for joining. Um, so um, I'm going to focus my talk on one specific uh, side of uh, machine learning in condensed matter physics. And uh, specifically, I'm going to focus uh, on the problem of using machine learning in the context of uh, uh, atomistic simulations. So. Uh, atomistic simulations is, you know, something that has been going on since at least the 1960s, and uh, the the idea and sort of the the hope behind uh, uh, atomistic modeling uh, is to be able to achieve truly predictive uh, uh, modeling of matter uh, by starting from a description of the interaction between uh, the microscopic components of the system, and then uh, the philosophy, so as to speak, is that. Uh, after having extracted uh, the microscopic properties, you know, let's say the elastic uh, constants uh, or the conductivity, you can feed these uh, into a hierarchy of coarser grain models uh, until uh, you manage to predict how a certain material will behave uh, in a mechanical component or in a device. Now, one of the key uh, challenges, uh, if you want to achieve uh, this uh, level of predictive accuracy is being able on one hand, uh, to achieve a very accurate description of the electronic structure of your system. This basically means that you need to solve uh, some very accurate approximation to the Schrodinger equation for one configuration of the nuclei. But at the same time, you also need to average over thermal, quantum fluctuations, disorder, which basically multiply by millions of times uh, the cost of evaluating energies and forces for one configuration. And it is in this repeat evaluation of the properties of the system as it undergoes thermal and quantum fluctuations that machine learning becomes really, really precious as a technique that allows you basically to reach the accuracy of uh, accurate electronic structure calculations, uh, but just paying the cost of some kind of approximate uh, empirical model. So how does this work? Well, it's not really that there is much uh, uh, magic involved. Uh, essentially, uh, let's say that you would use uh, a solution of some approximation of the Schrodinger equation to compute the potential for a configuration of the atoms that basically describe how stable that configuration is and how uh, dynamically it evolves in time. Well, rather than doing explicitly this quantum calculation, you would first train a machine learning model by just computing a small number of reference configurations, and then use this model as a surrogate to achieve the calculation of the potential. And then actually, uh, something that I will touch upon uh, in this presentation, uh, you can compute not only uh, the potential, but also any other property that you would be able to compute uh, by a quantum calculation, even though you might need to make your model a little bit more sophisticated. So to start, um, I want to kind of give a, a, a taste of uh, what are the specifics from a mathematical perspective of the models that are used uh, to describe matter at the atomic scale. So in very uh, abstract terms, uh, if you want to describe a molecule or a condensed matter system, uh, what you need to do is specify the position of the atoms and the nature of the atoms. So uh, from a mathematical perspective, a molecule or a material is nothing but a point cloud uh, characterized by three vectors that 
give the position of the atoms and by labels that determine whether each atom is hydrogen, carbon, or whatever else. And an alternative view, uh, which is actually more uh, um, familiar and more natural to chem informatics is to regard a molecule as a graph in which the atoms are uh, um, vertices and the bonds or the relationship between atoms form um, the, uh, the edges. And actually, of course, uh, you know, there is a lot that has been done for geometric deep learning in this abstract setting, but when we are dealing with atoms and with the physical system, there are additional uh, symmetries and additional requirements that we should incorporate into the model. So for starters, it's usually very beneficial to have models that are symmetric, meaning here, not that they fulfill some specific symmetry, but just that if you rigidly translate or rotate uh, a molecule, the value of the energy doesn't change. And so also the prediction of the model shouldn't change when you apply uh, one of these basic symmetries. Uh, another uh, requirement that is usually fulfilled by the relationship between a structure and a quantum mechanical property is a smoothness. So you com can compute derivatives and actually you can also benefit uh, from smoothness in terms of the learning efficiency of the model. So something that at a first glance would seem obvious, but actually in uh, conjunction with symmetry is not, uh, is the requirement that the mapping is complete. Meaning that if two structures are distinct, uh, it should be possible to predict that they have different properties. This is if they are not related by one of these basic symmetries. And another requirement which is less obvious, but is really important to achieve models that are transferable and uh, data efficient, uh, uh, is to be able to express uh, a macroscopic property, say the energy, the polarizability of the entire system uh, as a sum of contributions that are associated with each individual atom. So this additivity is basically what allows you to train your model on relatively simple systems and then being able to put the pieces back together and uh, make a prediction for something much larger and uh, you know, on a global scale, uh, much more complicated. So it turns out that once you uh, make all of these requirements on the structure of the model, uh, in a certain sense, your hands are tied. And even though over the past uh, decade, there have been uh, dozens uh, of uh, alternative frameworks that have been proposed to basically uh, determine the link between uh, an atomic structure and a suitable description that you can use in a machine learning model, actually, uh, you can show that the vast majority of these models uh, uh, can be traced back to a single construction in which uh, each atomic configuration is described by an endpoint correlation of the atom density. So those of you who are a little bit familiar with statistical mechanics will recall uh, the pair correlation function or the three body correlation function. Basically the descriptors that are used are just a pointwise form of these uh, correlation functions projected uh, and discretized on an appropriate basis. And basically different frameworks depend on the basis which is chosen and the way the projection is computed. Actually, you can generalize these uh, construction in many different directions. And recently we have been able to show that even some uh, uh, deep learning frameworks uh, based uh, on message passing constructs uh, can be expressed uh, in an appropriate limit uh, in the language of these uh, atom centered correlations. So, you know, once you have sort of laid out the foundations of all of these uh, uh, techniques, uh, it's interesting to give a brief overview of different uh, uh, applications that you can do that are made possible by all of these machinery. So for starters, something that used to be really, you know, one of these heroic tasks, determining the finite temperature thermodynamics of a material from first principles has now become relatively easy. 
I mean that this is something for which you used to have to write uh, a, a grant to get access to a supercomputer for uh, half a year. Now it's something that I'm not saying you can run on your laptop, but you can run in a small cluster uh, at the university level. And for example, we were able to compute uh, from first principles the uh, melting point of water with an error of less than five Kelvin, including also the quantum mechanical nature of the nuclei, meaning that we can get a difference in melting point between uh, uh, light and heavy water. Uh, you can measure the also very subtle free energy differences, for instance, that between hexagonal and cubic ice. And then, of course, since one of the nice aspects of uh, uh, doing uh, calculations is that you can uh, uh, realize extreme conditions without uh, uh, the need for very expensive laboratory equipment or without having to send uh, a probe in space, uh, you can uh, uh, compute the thermodynamics of hydrogen in conditions that are found in the core of giant planets. Uh, you can also do something a little bit less exotic, compute a phase diagram uh, uh, for a binary system. This is gallium arsenide, and this is a phase diagram that is very useful to uh, study the, the growth of some nanostructures. And something that you might notice here is that there is a considerable discrepancy between the, for instance, the melting point predicted for gallium arsenide and the experimental value. So at this point, one should ask oneself, well, is this the fault of the machine learning algorithm or is this the fault of the reference electronic structure calculations that we're using to train it? And you know, to address this question without having to do a first principle calculation, which would be prohibitively expensive, we have developed an uncertainty quantification scheme that allows us to put error bars on every quantity. And so for instance, we can verify that the error here, the statistical error of the machine learning model is really small. And actually the discrepancy is due to the reference calculation. So we have to go back and train the model on a more sophisticated electronic structure method. So as I anticipated, it's not just the potential energy that you can compute, you can also evaluate all sorts of response properties. Many of these properties have a tensorial nature, which requires some tweaks to the structure of the model. I will not get into details, uh, but once you have done these tweaks, you can, for instance, predict uh, the tensorial polarizability of molecules. Once again, we use uh, an atom-centered model, which means that we can predict uh, effective atomic polarizabilities. So for instance, when you have a conjugate system, the polarizability is larger in the plane of the molecule. And so if you have multiple molecules, given that your predictions are tensorial, they can sum up in the correct way, which helps a lot of transferability. You can also predict more sophisticated properties, such as the electron charge density. Uh, you can predict something like the electronic Hamiltonian. Think, for instance, to the self-consistent uh, Hamiltonian from DFT or from Harper Fock. And something which is really nice is that given that we built a model that is fully symmetric, a lot of the uh, symmetries that, for instance, occur when your molecule or your material has some point or space group symmetry are automatically built in. So for instance, here for benzene that has D6H point group symmetry, uh, if you try to learn a target Hamiltonian that is noisy, the machine learning model only learns the part that is asymmetric and uh, automatically it gives you molecular orbitals that have the correct symmetries based on the character table of D6H. So given that you can predict uh, potential and properties, you can also put these things together and simulate materials at finite temperature. For instance, study all uh, the ferroelectric uh, phase transition that occur in barium titanate, which is one of the uh, paradigmatic ferroelectrics. And you can predict not only the thermodynamics of the phase transitions, but also what happens when uh, uh, there are these uh, phase transitions uh, in terms of the dielectric properties of these material. 
another example. And uh, this is uh, a slide that I really like because so this is the heat capacity of nickel, and there is so much physics in here. So at low temperature, there is this strong deviation from the Long Petit limit that you know you study as an undergraduate as one of the uh, manifestations of the quantum mechanical nature of nuclei. So in order to model this regime, you need very uh, expensive path integral calculations, and these expensive calculations become completely inexpensive if you use a machine learning model. But now if you go at high temperature, even if you have a very good machine learning model trained on very accurate reference calculations, you can't capture the totality of the heat capacity because close to the melting point, electronic excitations start to play an important role. And here we predict from machine learning also the electronic contribution to heat capacity so that we can basically make a prediction of the full uh, heat capacity. And we are still missing this peak, which is, of course, related uh, to the ferromagnetic uh, transition in nickel. But there are other groups that have already started incorporating uh, magnetism in, uh, uh, in machine learning models. Of uh, another example, this is actually really from the uh, group of uh, Volker Deringer. Uh, you know, one of the nice aspects of machine learning models is that thanks to their atom-centered nature, they scale linearly with system size, which means that you can go to hundreds of thousands of atoms and study uh, processes such as uh, the phase transitions in amorphous silicon that really require large cells and uh, large long simulation times. Uh, uh, another example, uh, you can model uh, um, Spectroscopies, uh, here the IR and the Raman spectra in water, and you can really put all the physical terms. Here, uh, we're also incorporating uh, the quantum dynamics of the nuclei that determines uh, a substantial uh, red shift of uh, the stretching peaks. So, you know, I hope that I gave you a, a good overview of what's the state of the art. And I think that it's fair to say that machine learning techniques have already uh, allowed for an almost complete replacement of electronic structure calculations, of course, after you have trained the model on them. So, you know, it's not a really a complete replacement, it's more an enhancement or an extension of their reach. But, you know, what else could be done? And here, something that I'm uh, really excited about is the possibility of uh, mixing and matching uh, machine learning and physics-based methods. So what I mean here is basically uh, to predict by machine learning some of the quantities that enter a atomistic calculation, but then combine them using physics-based expressions. So just as an example, uh, this is actually a paper that appeared today. <laughs> um, it's uh, possible to compute the finite temperature Mermin free energy functional for an electron. So basically uh, the uh, finite temperature equivalent of uh, the Born-Oppenheimer energy of an electron in, uh, in a material. And uh, it's possible to compute these by first predicting by machine learning the ground state energy and the ground state density of states. And then we combine these with a an expression which is based uh, basically on physical approximations. And this allows us uh, just using uh, ground state calculations as a reference. Uh, basically, we can compute the behavior of an electron, in this case, in high pressure hydrogen, up to a temperature of 50,000 Kelvin. And I think that there is much more that can be done in this direction. So another aspect in which I think there is still quite some work to do is from the point of view of the mathematical foundations of these machine learning methods. Uh, very often, uh, you basically get a machine learning uh, framework uh, as a sort of a pre-arranged uh, uh, 
product that contains already many choices made for you. And I think that by continuing in this process of understanding the different ingredients that enter the construction of one of these models, it will become possible a little bit as one does now with electronic structure calculations to set yourself the different parameters and build a customized machine learning model that is the best for the problem that you want to solve. Another aspect on which I think there is still a lot of work to do is in combining uh, predictions from quantum calculations with experimental data to determine uh, machine learning models that can perhaps be even more accurate than the reference electronic structure calculation they are trained on, thanks to corrections brought in by the training on experimental data. So to wrap up, um, I think that there is a very nice interplay between physics-based and data-driven modeling, in, at least in the field of uh, uh, atomistic modeling of matter. And I think that it's nice really to see the uh, exchange of concepts from physics that enters basically as priors in a machine learning models, so symmetries, conservation laws, so on and so forth. But also, uh, it's very interesting to see how the use of data-driven techniques makes it possible to push physics-based modeling of matter to uh, new applications and uh, new regimes. So uh, thank you for listening, and I will basically now uh, leave it to you now. Um, Thank and, you very uh, much, Mika, for this, uh, for this quick, swift uh, overview. Um, and uh, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the link uh, in the chat function um, to the Slido website where you can ask questions. Uh, please uh, enter the first name of the speaker before you ask a question. So our next speaker is uh, Una Kim from Cornell University. So Una, please. Well, um, thank you. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me for this exciting opportunity. Um, um, and it was wonderful to learn from Mikhail, Mikhail's work that is slightly different um, perspective, like different angle. So Mikhail talked about um, trying to model, uh, predictively model what a collection of atoms would do when you, when you form a material. Now, what I want to focus on is um, what to do with the data that you've measured, um, starting from the experimental side. So um, in, uh, let's see if I can get the pointer going. So we want to go connect um, experimental data that's ever getting richer and more complex with theoretical insight and trying to make this bridge, um, two-way bridge, can be challenging when we have more and more information available to us. And um, in some of those efforts, because the ability to our ability to uh, ab initio stimulate uh, is also limited, one would like to also engage in using uh, quantum systems, and that brings in new type of data. So what I want to talk about today is how um, using machine learning tools as data science tools can help us uh, facilitate uh, making these bridges a uh, two-way bridge. So let me first talk about what the data-driven challenges are. Uh, tunneling density of states, uh, which is measured by uh, putting the material of your interest in between two other materials. For instance, here it's a superconductor you apply voltage and you have an insulator, well, you're, it's going to take certain amount of voltage before you start having conductance. And this is tunneling conductance, which measures tunneling density of states. This was a highly informative graph that were uh, foundational to the establishment of BCS theory of superconductivity. But fast forward to today, instead of having one curve, we have tens of thousands of curves because these uh, density of states are measured, tunneling spectra are measured at each position as a function of position with um, uh, sub angstrom scale resolution. X-ray diffraction in 1913, this is actually taken from this uh, original article in Proceedings of Royal Society by Bragg and Bragg, father and son. They were trying to make sense of three peaks that they observed 
And uh, they came up with the very first Ford model for X-ray diffraction, which is to say, okay, let me assume there are planes of atoms and um, let me consider what the interference signal would be with a single model parameter of the distance between the planes. This was a wildly successful model that is now taught in high school um, physics called the Bragg condition for the interference. Now, fast forward to today, instead of uh, measuring three peaks, we can measure uh, amount of data that uh, quickly reaches terabytes. So with all this information that we can collect, there's got to be more we can learn about the system. But the challenge is, what can we do with this volume of data? Projected measurements, this is a plaque uh, celebrating the stern gerlach experiment that we also often learn in uh, the introductory quantum mechanics topic. What this showed was that what seems to be a single polarized beam of electrons, well, um, silver atoms, would actually have two different states superposed in it. Now, this type of projective measurement was proving a, a, a Hilbert space of single spin, but uh, fast forward to today, we can now uh, study Hilbert space of um, 256 qubits. So um, how can we use machine learning to meet the data-driven challenges and um, make the most of the data that's available to us, make a, a bridge to theoretical insight and use the theory to predict what should happen in a new measurement. Now, um, these tools are, uh, the machine learning tools are like any other tools. There are different types of tools. This is a hand driven, um, hand crank drill. You can make a hole with it, but um, you know, if you have a power tool, power drill, you can not only make a, a hole much faster over many more um, boards, but by changing bits, you can do other things than just um, uh, making a hole. With a powerful tool like a power drill, always there will be a warning, safety warning. And the safety warning here is that if we take a method off the shelf and just throw it at, at a given problem of interest, First of all, we, um, the, the model that we use would give us some result, but it, we may not know why it is giving us the result. And therefore we, do, we may not know whether we can trust the result. So there has to be, as Michele pointed out, there has to be the interplay between uh, physical ideas and intuition and um, benchmark and, and the tools that we can use to uh, facilitate dealing with larger and um, co more complex data. So I want to just showcase um, two example cases. One is uh, supervised machine learning for hypothesis testing. Oftentimes when experiments are done, it's done with some hypothesis in mind. The experimentalist is throwing out a question, what is the right way to think about a certain phenomena? Under hypothesis, they design the experiment and carry out the experiment. Now, when you look at the data, data because of the real life, uh, uh, real life perturbations, um, data never looks exactly like what one would have drawn in the uh, with just the ideas alone. So then, from from that data, how do you know which hypothesis, once you introduce noise, would better describe the uh, the uh, underlying phenomena? We approach this problem as discriminating among different hypotheses as discriminating among different number, for instance, in the handwritten digit recognition or any other image recognition problem. So how does uh, supervised learning work? Well, um, supervised learning, to think about supervised learning, I first thought about um, training kids. So this poor kid has to make a decision upon dropping precious ice cream. And when kids drop food, they are going to take input, um, such as how long it has been since the food has dropped, whether uh, your, um, um, your mother or father, the, uh, the bad cop uh, parent is watching, how sweet is it uh, for my kids, how green is it? This is an, also an important question. So you take this input. And then you're trying to come up with an output. 
for the case of our data, we're trying to come out with an output of which of the following hypotheses best describe my data, given the input. Now the input should be treated as a vector and different parts of the brain will put different amount of emphasis on different pieces of the data. So uh, that process can be thought of as there being a matrix connecting the input vector, uh, x1, x2, x3 components to a particular neuron. So there is a matrix, that's the weight matrix, and different neurons would have different bias, and that's here's the bias vector. And the whole um, uh, linear combination going through a nonlinear function would give expressibility. So if this is how the decision is made, given the weights and bias, the training process is trying to let the neural network or a child adjust its own um, weights and biases to come out with the decision that uh, we believe is the correct decision. Um, at the end of the day, the whole process can be thought of as writing a function that's mapping the input to the decision space. And um, once we think of it as a function, um, we can make the function more and more complex by increasing the number of hidden layers or by introducing um, intermediate steps such as convolutional mapping. So um, we went through this whole process for this, uh, the, uh, a whole decade worth of data collected by my colleague, um, Seamus Davis, um, who has studied uh, high TCQ print materials with scanning tunneling microscopy. So this is scanning tunneling microscopy data. You can see the scale from the scale bar. So we have analyzed a decade's collection of data to um, assess from this data set whether underlying this uh, beautiful but irregular uh, pattern repeating seemingly some um, a fixed set of motifs is best de described starting from momentum space or free fermions, thinking starting from the Fermi surface nesting, or should we start from sort of a local starting point where there are spins at the copper sites that have filling and we introduce holes that get doped into the oxygen sites. And the um, frustration of spin interaction between this hole and this copper and uh, between the copper and copper is, is leading to this pattern formation. So with each of these hypotheses, we generated uh, training data and we trained neural network to tell the different, uh, the data generated from different hy hypotheses apart. And then we gave the uh, real data to the neural network. The outcome was to favor uh, real space or strong coupling limit starting point. And that gave us a new way to uh, look at the uh, decades collection of the data, having um, previously unrecognized universality that in all of those data sets, there is underlies is organizational principle where the dominant motif is period four charge modulations that are unidirectional that's running in one direction and lattice commensurate. And now we are um, in investigating how these uh, observations can help us better understand mysteries of high TCQ rate. Now, what about unsupervised learning? So what I showed earlier was an example of supervised learning where we have labeled training set and we train the neural network to learn, the learn to distinguish different labels. And then uh, we give the real data and see, uh, we, we give the uh, previously unseen data and have neural network decide uh, which uh, hypothesis best describe the, the, uh, the data. Now this uh, it has built in bias because the labeling and the selection of training set and the hypothesis were chosen by the researcher. Now, can we make progress in learning without um, such uh, presupposed bias? So these are, this is a, a illustration showing um, of large volume of X-ray data as it, the, the data set evolves as a function of temperature. 
if you want to study the evolution of data as a function of temperature, and from that, learn some a theme, some trend, um, how can we do that? And that's what was described in this recent publication. So um, if I want to find a special piece from this large, um, embarrassingly large pile of Lego, which I was often asked to do during pandemic, um, we quickly learned picking up one piece at a time and trying to see whether that's the piece that I'm searching for is not a good strategy. We get tired, we start to kind of blank out and we miss the piece. Then how do we approach looking for that special piece or looking for something um, interesting in large pile of data? Well, you wanna start by sorting. So if you are dealing with Lego, a natural choice would be sorting by color. What if you're dealing with X-ray data? What would be a natural choice of sorting? How can you introduce some sort of criteria without, uh, without presupposed bias, but something that will capture what we are interested in? So by emergence here, I mean um, collective phenomena driven by interaction, which is um, there is my Hamiltonian, which is giving me energy. And then there is entropy, which is always trying to maximize. And the balance is given by temperature. As I lower the temperature, I will see more of the cooperative effect driven by um, Hamiltonian. And um, watching how the data evolves as a function of temperature will tell me which part, which part to look at that is meaningful. So now we're gonna treat the different momentum space positions as uh, reciprocal space positions as if they are uh, population. And uh, we track the X-ray intensity or any diffraction intensity or scattering intensity as a, a series uh, sitting on each of those sites. We treat this as a sort of lifetime of a person so person here is a particular Q point and the lifetime trend is a temperature series. What can we be learning in X-ray? We can learn about um, periodicity changing that is unicell changing features such as charge density wave. We can also learn uh, features that do not change the unicell size, but change uh, structure inside the unicell such as in intra-unicell order. We can also learn about fluctuations. So the example that I want to highlight here where we had a successful application, very first application, it was a pyrochloric cadmium renate, which is a material that eventually goes superconducting. But before going superconducting, starting from room temperature, it first goes through a, a sequence of structural transitions. This particular transition has large specific heat signal, but the displacement um, showing the structural change is at a picometer scale. So now picometer scale, that is smaller than uh, size, or size of hydrogen atom. It's a very small scale. And what can we learn about what's happening at picometer scale, which is changing the symmetry property of the system, making it lose inversion symmetry. So we get eight terabytes of data from our experimentalist colleagues, and we put it through our algorithm, X-ray temperature series clustering, x -tech. And in 10 minutes, we get the outcome of uh, that sorting all this uh, collection of temperature series into a representative behavior. So these two uh, solid, uh, these two curves are um, showing a representation of one cluster compared to a re representation of another cluster. This is mean, this is variance. And this tells me in this mess, in this soup, there are reciprocal space points that are behaving like order parameter, and there are points that are behaving like uh, noise. It, this is very quick to do. Now, once we get to this point, we want to start learning a little more detail. And um, given the uh, limited time, I'm not going to go into the further detail, but let me just brag about the discoveries enabled by this tool. Uh, first of all, we were able, we learned that, that there is um, off, uh, out of out of sync displacement between cadmium and rhenium. And this out of sync distance is 0.05 angstrom scale. However, um, the fact that they become out of sync changes the symmetry of the system. Furthermore, we were able to detect uh, a Goldstone mode associated with this two dimensional order parameter um, living in nearly degenerate space 
and this ghost mode fluctuation was detected by uh, by studying the uh, the um, fluctuation effects diffuse signal from the data. So to summarize, I uh, made a case for using machine learning tools to learn about emergent phenomena in quantum matter data as the data becomes richer and more complex and larger in volume. I went over how one could use supervised machine learning to do hypothesis testing and uh, also unsupervised machine learning to cluster and get accelerate discoveries. Um, I think of the present moment to be sort of like re reliving replay of this moment. This is uh, seen from hidden figures where um, these group of human computers learned how to program a new big giant machine. Uh, and they transitioned successfully from being human computers who were replaced by machines to programmers programming the big machine to uh, calculate the trajectory uh, for the uh, for NASA. I think we're at that moment where we can learn to use these tools and accelerate discoveries and um, become capable of looking at a rich set of data that are now pouring out in a comprehensive manner. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to both of you for uh, for these exciting talks. Um, we have some questions. So uh, first, uh, uh, to Una. Um, Professor Kim, uh, the processing conditions for the sample material could influence the XRD data. Can the model, can your model pick up such effects, such uncertainties? Okay, so the question is, um, how we do the pre-processing can affect what we can learn from data, is that, and can we pick up the effect of such pre-processing? That's the question, right? Okay. So um, answer is yes. So um, we, so there, that's where um, the human machine um, engagement and synergy happen in two places and in the, in the pre-processing stage and in interpretation of the outcome, outcome stage. Um, depending on the degree of, depending on the pre-processing, we will learn things that are meaningful, or sometimes we will just pick up, uh, pick up, not so useful information. For instance, once we got really excited and learned that there was some glitch in the system, the experimental system, where you know somebody banged something really hard. So um, what we do, what we do is a lot of uh, sort of a cycle, feedback cycle. We try a pre-processing, we get to the end, and we see whether, the, whether we can make sense out of the result. And if we can make sense out of the result, that pre-processing was uh, well uh, functioning. If we cannot make sense out of the result, we have to go back and ask, um, did we do the most effective pre-processing? Because none, no machine can replace human intelligence, um, asking for uh, trying to decide on the pre-processing that are insightful for the scientific question that we are after is absolutely important role human researcher plays. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Um, the question for uh, Michaela, um, which, uh, which GNN ready-made free packages would you recommend for someone who wants to use them and train for specific problems? Somewhat of a leading question. Okay, I, I probably wouldn't use a GNN, <laughs> at least not one based on uh, on interatomic distances only. No, uh, th th there are many packages. Uh, I would say that uh, it, it, we are still in a phase where most of the packages are undergoing uh, a lot of development. So. Uh, uh, it depends a lot on really what you want to do. And uh, I have heard the good things uh, in terms of uh, user friendliness uh, for the um, uh, DeepMD uh, package. Uh, seems like it's uh, uh, comparatively easy to use. Uh, but uh, otherwise, if you, you know, they, there is the... Uh, 
well, there is the good old Quip package from Gabor, but I don't know if you would still uh, recommend it. It's definitely very stable and time tested. Uh, Snap from uh, uh, Sandia. Uh, it's also quite easy to use. And then uh, there are a number of recent packages that use uh, uh, um, linear regression, but with sophisticated uh, many body features. Uh, and here uh, there is Pace, uh, Mace, <laughs> uh, there is uh, MTP. There, there is really a lot. So uh, I don't know, pick your poison. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, next question, uh, Tuna, is how easy it is to understand the trends that you've picked up in terms of the known physical physical knowledge that we know already. Um, do you pick up sort of trivial things, or how do you how do you get how do you purge the th the, the trends that you pick up uh, uh -huh. so that you only have the non-trivial things? Very very good already? question. So often we approach the problems with. Um, uh, with a set of set of benchmarks, so we want to make sure we can pick up trivial things. We want to pick up not so not so, uh, not necessarily trivial, but we want to pick up. We want to make sure we can pick up things that are known that we know how to think about. And once that is cleared, um, then we try to see whether we can go beyond that. So when we are looking at X-ray data, for instance, we will pick up the ordering um, temperature very easily. We will pick up the ordering wave vectors, and we we can go look at whether that wave vector is the wave vector that we would have thought of um, based on uh, pre-existing knowledge. And then we try to, and then we can see whether there are additional ordering happening at temperatures that were not previously detected. What is happening uh, with the fluctuations in the diffuse signal? So we try to always build on something that we know. Mm -hmm. uh, just a reminder to the uh, um, attendees that you can also post your questions into the Zoom chat uh, as well as the Slido. I have a, a, a generic question uh, to both of you, um, which is: Do you see um, or to, uh, what, how, do you see the role of uh, of ML in uh, in material science um, and materials physics as mostly sort of a, a, a slightly a better drill, uh, something that is cheaper or speeds things up a little bit, or is it transformational? Do you see it, um, do, do you see, does it enable things that we couldn't do before, kind of regardless of, of how expensive it was? Uh, Una first. So um, I, I, I was reading a book about um, Ada Lovelace, who was the first programmer, um, and um, at the time, the idea of making this machine that can compute was um, driven by the notion that uh, people who were working on calculating the logarithms for the table of logarithms, it was just too expensive. And you know, once you burn a big table of logarithm to regenerate it was going to take 10 years. And you know, it required a whole, whole lot of people sitting in a building calculating. And wouldn't it be nice if you can, can have a machine that would do that? Of course, none of us use a table of logarithms today, although it is in principle possible. Why, right? I can just, today I can ask Alexa, what is log two? Alexa will answer me. So that I, I think of speeding up as enabling, being able, allowing us to do things that were not possible because even if it is in principle possible in the age of universe, None of us live the age of universe. Definitely graduate students don't stay for age of universe and they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Michele? Yeah, I sort of uh, uh, agree with Una. Um, the, I mean, you, you, you say whether it is just a tool uh, as being just a tool was something reductive, but a lot or if not all of the scientific revolutions uh, have been uh, driven by the development of a new tool. So I would say that in many cases, the speed up that you can achieve uh, is truly transformative. And I would also say that uh, um, something that I uh, neither Yuna nor I have touched upon, uh, but there are uh, also attempts to use machine learning to solve many body uh, 
the many body quantum problem, like, uh, you know, build better ansatzes for uh, variational wave functions and so on and so forth. And there, I would say that, you know, thinking in terms of a machine learning uh, uh, framework allows you to do things that wouldn't have been possible uh, uh, with previous techniques. So here's a technical question. So a lot of physics, particularly experimental uh, support work, was uh, pre was uh, for a long time done at uh, using sort of low level computer languages. So Fortran, uh, of course, is very heavily used in physics. Um, which what do you use in particular? Do you use uh, modern uh, top level languages R Python, or do you think that that when we come to the big experiments and uh, and physics or big calculations, we're back to C and Fortran? You know. I use Python. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you find that the experimentalist that's compatible with, with yes. your- Yes, many experimentalists with... use Python. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There yeah. was one case where we were trying to interface with Fortran, I don't know, 77. And there we eventually we gave up. Michele? Um, I couldn't pay anybody enough to do that. So yeah, I'm mostly using Python. Uh, and uh, I, I'm learning Rust. <laughs> what is that? Rust is a is a new. It's a compiled language. It's basically uh, it's it's vaguely similar. It's a kind of a, the syntax is halfway between C and Python, but it's compiled and it's very good for parallelism. But no, I would say it's mostly Python. And actually, the point with Python is actually that there are a number of dialects. So you know, if you use uh, PyTorch or NumPy, it's almost as an entirely different programming language. So here's a, here's a follow up question: um, Do you uh, use pre built optimization and fitting techniques, tools like Scikit-Learn, or do you build uh, custom neural networks? Uh, again, Una first. So we we started with custom neural networks, something as simple as what you pick up from a textbook. Um, and the, and then we started use we were using scikit learn if often what we start from what we what's available or we try to build on what's available but often we find we have to customize to some degree you know sometimes we just write it ourselves but um there often we need customization because what's available off the shelf are not working with the same kind of constraints. Like we want to make sure there's a symmetry, but that was not important for self-driving cars. Um, so we need to think about what is our problem and what portion of our problem matches the everyday world problem many of these packages are written for and where we need to introduce new aspects, new constraints and new criteria. Okay, Michele. It's fun. Uh, we, we started uh, doing our own uh, and uh, we definitely switched to using as much as possible uh, uh, pre-existing packages also because you make it easier to users. Actually, when we implement something ourselves now, we try to mimic the syntax and the, uh, you know, the usage patterns of uh, existing packages just because you tap into this huge community of users and developers. So it's really worth to stick with the standard tools, I think. Okay, so I think uh, Una has to uh, leave uh, for official business. So thank you very much for your talk and, and for answering thank the you. questions. And uh, there's one more question uh, for Michele. Um, what new science could you learn from real atomistic simulations on a quantum computer as originally suggested by Feynman? Ooh. So I, I don't know. I, I think that the question of whether... Uh, so the, there is this interesting and very controversial paper on the archive, uh, um, which asks the question of whether exponential quantum supremacy for quantum chemistry will ever be possible. Um, which is, I, I think it's an interesting question because the idea behind the using a quantum computer to simulate a quantum system uh, is that uh, uh, somehow a quantum computer is ideally adapted uh, to the problem. Uh, but it turns out that, in, so you, um, apparently uh, you can prove mathematically that for an arbitrary quantum chemical system, 
even a quantum algorithm will be exponential. Basically, if you have infinite uh, uh, correlations, uh, infinite extent of correlations, then uh, even a quantum algorithm would take an exponential time. And if there are no uh, infinite length correlations, then most of the time you can come up with classical heuristics that are not exponential. So I think it's an interesting question, uh, and it's not necessarily the case that a quantum computer will allow to simulate something that if you are smart enough, you cannot simulate with a classical algorithm. And, uh, but of course, some of the machine learning algorithms, the classical ones, if I can implement them on the quantum computer. Ah, yeah. Goes backwards, right? Well, but in general, this is- That's not I the mean, Feynman suggestion, but- But in, in the field of machine learning, usually is the optimization, right? Uh, is the uh, is the minimize is the training uh, whether you can get a better fitting? Uh, yeah, no, I, I I I don't know. This is not really a field in which I'm very active, and so I don't want to make predictions. Uh, um, my impression is that we will be able to do a lot of exciting stuff with classical computer uh, in the in the near future. And perhaps, uh, you know, in 10 years from now, we will have uh, something even more exciting on a quantum computer. Okay, great. Thank you very much, especially for answering the questions at length. And thanks both to uh, Una and, uh, and Michele. And um, I uh, would like to remind uh, uh, the audience that uh, the next uh, event in this series um, of, uh, of online seminars is going to be uh, continuing with machine learning in fluid dynamics and climate physics. It's uh, at the same time uh, next Wednesday. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody.